It's good to be here. Thanks for coming on a Sunday, Sunday lunchtime. Um, to my direct right is uh, Konstantin Gricic, um, industrial product designer, um, who needs no more introduction. I know a lot of the faces here, so I, I know you know um, Konstantin's work well. And also, um, uh, next along, uh, Martin Boyce, whose, uh, whose work uh, most of you also know. I'm Alex Coles. I, um, the reason we're here, or partly the reason we're here, is to launch a book, The Transdisciplinary Studio, which has just come out through um, Sternberg Press in Berlin. Um, and it is available in all good bookstores for 22 euros, and probably some bad bookstores as well, I guess. Um, I'll just say a little about the framework for the book, um, just to introduce things, and then Constantin and Martin are going to um, talk a little bit about their studios and, and how their studios developed. Um, so this notion of the transdisciplinary studio, the, the transdisciplinary has become a concept that is replacing the um, interdisciplinary. If you think of the interdisciplinary as when we had things like design art, the relationship between design and art, with the transdisciplinary is a kind of stage beyond that whereby practitioners from across architecture, design, and art are working across those fields within one practice, even if they are mostly thought of as a designer, an artist, or an architect. And what I did was to spend up to three months in a series of different studios. Um, for the first volume, the one that's just come out, um, I spent some time with uh, Oliver Eliasson, in uh, Berlin with uh, Konstantin in Munich, uh, with Jorge Pardo in, um, in Mexico, in the Yucatan, and with a design, graphic design collective in London called Abaki. And what I was trying to do was introduce a new kind of research to writing about art, design, and architecture. What you could call a, an <coughs> embedded type of research. Um, and I, I thought by spending time in each of the studios, observing, um, interviewing uh, studio assistants and so forth, that I'd, somehow I would get closer to the process by which the ideas are generated for the work and the work itself is uh, actually fabricated. My sort of selfish interest was to try and kickstart writing about art, design, and architecture, um, and write in a way that was much more dynamic and, and much more engaging. Um, this kind of method's often called um, the participant observation method, which comes, from, um, which comes from anthropology, and it's associated with someone who observes the culture, uh, around them, but also participates in it in, to some degree, which is what I did when I spent time uh, in each of the studios. And Martin and I have just started a dialogue which will uh, continue in the second volume, which, which will come out next year. Um, now, Constantin and Martin are just going to say a few sort of general things about their studios, how they've developed. Uh, how they use the studio as a tool, uh, and then I'll have some sort of more general points across both of you. Are, are you okay to? Shall I start? Yes. Um, I should start at the beginning, and that is um, 1991, when I finished uh, my studies at the Royal College of Art in London, and, uh, and set up my own studio relatively directly after finishing my studies. And setting up the studio um, at that time, this is, um, this is 20 years ago, it was, um, had no business plan, of course. It was very naive in a way. It was very small scale. 
if you imagine there was, um, there were, I was buying the first computer then, there was no internet, there was a fax machine and telephone was a, a kind of an infrastructure or facility which was kind of the, the, the most important to have. And my first studio was actually um, renting desk space, that's what it was called. Uh, so you, uh, you, you share a studio with others and there was already a telephone line and there was a fax machine we all shared and I had a desk. Um, the size a meter fifty by a meter, and that was really my my space uh, from which everything seemed possible at least at that very beginning um, and it was really nice <laughs> uh, that things were so simple then and uh, now, twenty years later, my studio of course has become much more complicated um, with all the the, the the facilities the equipment. Uh, with more people, um, but also in terms of how things work. But the complication is also good, of course, I wanted this. Um, the studio is still relatively small. There's six of us um, all together, uh, four designers, which I employ, one personal assistant. We all, we work in, a, in one large open plan space in Munich, actually, um, in the south of Germany, which as a location, is uh, relevant uh, for the work we do. We work uh, uh, mainly with clients. Uh, that means industrial companies that produce our work. In fact, when I set up my studio in 1991, the desk space, I already called myself industrial designer. I, I was hardly working for industry then, but uh, this is what I wanted to do. And this is what we still do today. However, and this is, the, in a way, the topic, uh, of course, of, to, of the talk, uh, the, the studio and, and what we do from, from the studio has changed. And it's become much more than industrial design, which is still the core, um, kind of um, still takes the core of our time. But other projects have started to develop and evolve. We do exhibition design, designing exhibitions, but also partly curating them, which all started maybe 10, 12 years ago with a company that I work with who asked me to kind of curate their collection and make shows of what they produce. And I, I enjoyed that. And I, I've, I've since then made it uh, almost a second um, part of what we do in the studio exhibition. Um, but now one of the, the projects we will be doing um, from after the summer is uh, working on uh, costumes for a ballet. Um, this is uh, something will be quite new and different. Um, we are uh, <laughs> involved in um, in in design work which is not necessarily designing products, but it's, it's more to do with going inside companies and understanding how they operate, how, what it means for them to be producers, to, be, um, to do their research, production, even, even um, the, the, the selling. Uh, so I think my studio has changed and evolved. In the same way as the, the whole idea of what a designer is has changed, we are still designers giving form to something, but we um, giving form to something is not necessarily just the physical object, but it's, it's trying to design processes or organizing things and so on. So. And, and there's one thing I wanted to ask you about before we go on to Martin. Um, when I first went to Con Constantin's studio a few years ago, I said I'd like to come and talk to you about the studio, and the first thing that you said was, but I don't think of it as a studio, I think of it as an office. Ah, yes. Could you say something about that, what that word me means, means for you? Well, I, I guess in the same way as I, 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 um, I called my little desk, uh, Constantin Gertrude's industrial design at the from the very beginning, I always liked the idea of um, of an office in a way um, in a way 
professionalizing what I, <laughs> what it actually was at the time. And I, I prefer the, the term office to studio because I think that um, it also made clear that we are not, we, we are, um, we are kind of involved in, with industry and their, um, with clients. Even I, I just, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a very personal thing. I like, I like the idea of the office and of going to the office in the morning, um, <laughs> leaving the office in the evening. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's really, it, it doesn't, you noticed it. And it was interesting that we, we then spoke about it. It, it was something that really um, was important way back for me, and I, I still keep it that way. I talk about my, my office as an office. Uh, and, and, and that also implies a certain organization of that space, but also of, the, of what the everyday life is like. We have very strict office hours. <laughs> um, nobody's allowed to come before nine, and people have to leave by seven, and nobody's allowed to come in on the weekends, and we have a, 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 there's a lunch break at a set hour. And a pretzel break and a tea break in the morning. So silly things, but um, somehow um, uh, I, I like them that way. The, the, this kind of form of structuring creates a lot of freedom within that structure. And, uh, and this has become, this has been, uh, this has mattered to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Martin? Yeah, um, it sounds like we have quite a sort of parallel sort of uh, Sort of situation. I mean, I, I graduated my undergraduate in 1990 uh, from Glasgow School of Art. Um, and at that point, you know, like most people, you're sharing, a, you're sharing a flat with a bunch of other young artists. And so the, the, the kitchen table was the studio. I mean, and, and sometimes you had to take turns. You know, to, to, if somebody had a project or something they were working on, it was like they got, you know, the, the kitchen table for that <laughs> week. And actually, relatively recently, I, I did a solo show in New York um, a couple of years ago, and I was in between studios, and I pretty much produced the show from my kitchen table. Um, yeah, and in Glasgow, when I graduated, and, and really for quite a long time, uh, my generation of artists didn't have studios. It, it, it was sort of, it wasn't really, it was felt that it was a sort of traditional model that was unnecessary. And we all started traveling quite a lot uh, to make shows, working with young galleries. And so you would use, you know, you'd use your bedroom as the thinking space, and then you would use the gallery as the making space. Um, because the, ga the galleries you were showing with at that time couldn't afford to ship the work, so they would ship you. <laughs> and, you know, I, so I started making work that was, you know, came about from that situation. So I would go and make wall paintings. I would go and I'd go to the local DIY store, buy masking tape and pots of paint, and we'd, I'd make a wall painting. Um, and then over time, it, it, it became, well, I don't, did I think I needed a studio? The other thing is I've never looked for and found a studio. Someone's always, it's usually uh, someone in the crowd, who kind of says, Here's a room. Maybe this could be useful for you. You go, oh yeah, that's a good, that's a good room. Yeah, how much is it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and that, that's really what's the, the three studios I've had uh, ever uh, have been pretty much in that, you know, come about in that situation more or less. Um, <clears throat> and so it's never been about, you know, the ideal studio. You know, I, I mean, I'm a sculptor primarily. I work, I make things, uh, and I make large-scale installations or arrangements of sculptures, but my studio is on the third floor of a building right in the middle of Glasgow, uh, and the elevator is, you know, this size. So it's not practical uh, in, in that in a sort of conventional sense, but I really like it. I really like being there. I like going there. Um, and so there are works that get made there, or aspects of the work get made there. But then I also work very closely with a, a workshop, with a fabrication company uh, in Glasgow. And increasingly, they, you know, it's like an extension of the studio. So, it's, so I, I, in my studio, I'll you know, work on prototypes or models, uh, drawings, um, until 
until very recently, I would do, I, I hand draw all the technical drawings for, uh, you know, for the fabricators on a little drawing board this size that I got for my Christmas when I was about 12, when I wanted to be an architect. And, and so the, the, then I go and I meet with the, the workshop and, you know, and by this point we've been now working together for 10 years or so and we really have a, it's a great relationship, we, we really understand each other, I can be there when I need to be there. And so it's, it's absolutely not a case of, you know, there's the drawing in the model, I'll come back when it's finished. It, it, it's, it's an ongoing process, so, so they, they do the, you know, the cutting and welding and, and shaping and, of, of, of most of the, the parts, and then uh, I'll come up and then we'll, we'll change things. So it's quite live, you know, that we'll actually go, well, actually, that's, that's, that's not quite right. Let's cut this off here and we'll move this up here. And let's rust this piece and let's do this. Which means, so, so, so again, it's like, you know, I sort of occasionally I ask myself or someone asks me, you know, well, why don't you have, a, have your own workshop with your own people, you know, doing that work? But, but I guess the reality is, you know, I don't, you know, I, then the, you have this pressure of, um, yeah, you know, if you have a weld, you employ a welder, you need to find things for him to weld all the time, and like maybe that's <laughs> not going to be the case. Um, I mean, that was something that struck me about both of, both of your studios was the way that you outsourced a lot of things, which was a complete contrast to the two other studios I'd spent time in. Um, to Alafor and Jorge's, whereby everything was embedded in the studio. Um, everything was, the ideas were generated in the studio, um, uh, things were researched within the studio, and everything's fabricated within the studio. So they both have this immense control over everything, um, or perhaps just a different type of control because of that proximity. But you've both sort of actively chosen to, to not embed those things. But is that just for the practical reasons like, like you mentioned or? But I, I mean, it's, I, I mean, I've, because it's this sort of accumulative effect of how you work and, and, and in some cases you create a situation because this is how you work. And in other cases, you work because this is the situation. You know, mm -hmm. it's like one thing affects the other, one, one thing pulls and another pushes. And, 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 I, and I, I kind of don't know whether I work the way I work because that's the situation I'm in. And I could, I could potentially change that, but, but then I don't see the need to because it's working, you know? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one. It's not, it's, it's, it's like, Practicality mm -hmm. and, and also, I guess, and it might be a, a different for you, Constant, but I mean, being an artist isn't particularly practical, you know, and the process quite often isn't practical on, on all sorts of levels, you know, mm -hmm. economically and kind of, mm -hmm. and, and just in a, as a lifestyle or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, and so you kind of, you, you kind of muddle your way through mm -hmm. until you find something that, that seems to work. Mm. And it's, it's, for me, it's, it's, it seems to be working now, you know. Mm. It, it, it's interesting and because it sounds so familiar, but of course on a, on, a, on a different, what you do is so different in the end to what we do as industrial designers. We, first of all, we, we really work for clients. So in the end, uh, what we design will be produced at the end very professionally and, and for sure by someone else. Um, but the development of that work um, is is uh, is a process that, uh, of course, we are very involved in, and and we can we somehow we choose, of course, how how that process is. And what I liked about your um, your description is exactly this: um, the kind of the two the two scenarios, one which is the the kind of the limitation um, which informs how you work and what you do. And I would say that even the way my office is set up builds in this limitation. I, I really want mm. such a limitation. Um, um, for example, the way we make models. Of course, we make models. Um, but I don't have a workshop. I've, I deliberately don't have a workshop 
Um, and it's like your story with the welder. Even having certain machinery would make me want to use this machinery. And, and uh, not having the machinery, in a way, is a limitation, because then we just make things from paper. But at the same time, it just makes things much more free. We can mm. do what we want to do. And then the other scenario is the extension of this limitation uh, by involving other people, um, other you know, outside workshops, having things made by whoever. And, and for us, of course, this extension, which is also is not only the facility of making things, but also a kind of um, it's also the, 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 the know-how that you kind of you can bring in from outside. Um, which for us industry means uh, working with engineers, working with people um, that are very, um, very the specialists. Specialists, yeah. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and and I think I I have to be um, specialist enough to recognize the specialist <laughs> <laughs> and to you know to make to challenge the mm -hmm. specialist. But I, I never mm -hmm. want to be. The only specialist, therefore, that would mean I, I. The only thing I do is within my specialization. Mm, mm. Uh, so it's it's kind mm. of um, mm. probably not 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 possible to define exactly how it works, but it is a moving in between these kind of poles of the mm. the, the constraint and and the the kind of keeping things very mm. open and mm. and uh, mm. and also you know of course we 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 change. Um, I mean I I, I work very different today than I worked 20 years ago or even three years ago. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it may be that tomorrow I think, wouldn't it be nice to work like 10 years ago? And then that would, should also mm. be possible. Mm. Mm. And, and one thing that was interesting I saw was because both Martin and Constantin outsource fabrication, um, which, uh, you know, obviously Constantin's ca case is, is, is a necessity when you're dealing with that kind of volume. Um, but because fabrication is outsourced, you both use the maquettes. And particularly you, Constantin, um, people that don't know too much about the process by which Constantin designs, it's very, um, very tactile and very, very much working with materials and shaping a, um, a, a, a life-size a life-size model before the, the, the prototype and and also with, with yourself but with you know the, the maquettes I saw on the last visit were were at scale yeah I mean I think I mean sometimes I, I, the other thing is that you, as things progress um, the things that you really you used to really enjoy doing like hand drawing the, the technical drawings you don't have time to do anymore and I used to, one of my favorite things to do is to make these maquettes. And I think I used to make them for a number of reasons. And sometimes it was to have something to do. Yeah. I mean, of course, it was to kind of, well, see or try and understand this form. But it only gives you so much information. It doesn't give you mm. all the information you need. Mm. But it was also just the process of something becoming three-dimensional in front of your eyes. And it was just, mm. you felt like, you'd, you know, at the end of the day, you felt like you mm. achieved mm. something. Mm. Um, and that, that happens, that's, that still continues to happen, but I, I don't meticulously make a maquette for everything I, for mm. everything I do. It, mm. it doesn't always work mm. quite like that. I mean, quite mm. often it's, yeah, it's a combination of, sort of full-size drawings, you know, bits mm. of cardboard and mm. so on, just the usual mm. you know, way of thinking mm. through things. Mm. And what surprised me with uh, last year, Constantin did a, maybe your first, I think it was, proper limited edition, um, series with uh, Gallery Creo in, in Paris. And one thing that surprised me there was perhaps one of the few opportunities um, you had whereby something wasn't going to be mass produced and that possibly could have been um, fabricated or elements of it fabricated or finished uh, in-house, but, but again, you chose to work with a, a specialist uh, lacquerer, um, someone that had worked on the BMW art cars, the Stellar and Warhol and so forth in the 70s. So that was, uh, I, I thought, you know, that really surprised me, but in a, in a good way. But uh, Well, it, it, this, this particular project, which is 
large aluminium tables uh, painted like race cars or sports equipment. It originally was a project I wanted to do for a producer uh, uh, on an industrial scale uh, because every bicycle frame that you buy is full of paint and graphics and so on or as, uh, skis or tennis records. This is what I liked and it, it, the, the inspiration really comes from an industrial product but the furniture industry for some reason w wasn't ready for it or they were scared of it they, because um, uh, furniture never has things written on it. Um, and so, because I was just interested in, in this project, in the notion of what happens to furniture if we say it is fast. <laughs> Changes a table to say that it's a fast table, it's ridiculous, but the same actually goes for a pair of skis, it's the same pair of skis um, if you write, um, I don't know, racing on it, or you say, um, I don't know, comfort. <laughs> um, uh, but psychologically, of course, something changes, and, and this is what I was interested in, and, and the way we were able to realize the project in the end was on that kind of much smaller scale, um, mm. working with, an in, with a, a gallery, which is a, the kind of experimental space then for, for such projects, and with craftsmen, with a guy who not only painted the art cars, but he was actually a racing driver, and oh. and he came into that whole business for from his racing. I didn't know racing, <laughs> um, but I, now in retrospect, I think this experience made it so much stronger than had we designed, this, had we done this project for industry, the process of developing these graphics, which the project was all about, um, would have probably been much more synthetic or uh, detached from its making. We would have designed it on the computer. Um, the, the, kind of the project, as it turned out, working with this, the lacquerer, made it so much more um, kind of immediate and um, hands-on, even though, of course, we didn't spray it. <laughs> but um, And, and I, I think that made the project uh, be so much better. And it, of course it shows that, that lots, especially with um, projects where you, where you go onto a new territory, this, the, the, the feedback, the friction, the, 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 the kind of the, the analog the, or, or empirical, you make it, and you, uh, learning by doing, getting your hands on it matters so much. Mm. Nowadays, with a lot of the industrial design, I, you know, I can, can probably jump some hurdles uh, in the beginning of, because some things are repetitive and I've done them before. I know what it means to put two tubes together, but still, in the end, we never design things purely on a computer, sending drawings somewhere and they make it and it's, it would be fine. Yeah. There's always the, the kind of, um, the need to be the, 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 the physical moment of, you know, having something there sitting in front of you, made of a material, changing it, and, and, and so on. Mm. Well, I think the, my experience of, uh, it, it wasn't the first time I, I came in contact with your work, but um, the, the, the Mito chair, mm. which there was a, um, I got really excited about this chair, and it was after reading about the actual material that it was yeah. made from. Mm. And I, I phoned up the company and I phoned up Plank and said, you know, have you got any information on this? <laughs> Did you? Yeah, they, they, they said, the guy was really nice. He sent me this, the book and the book mm. really documents the mm. whole process. Mm. And it's quite rare to have that insight into one object and how it kind of starts off as like, you know, bits of cardboard in, in, a, in a studio and then sort of through the production process. And that, that oh. was really, it was a real eye opener. And, and actually sort of, it made me think that in terms of process, it wasn't as mystical, there wasn't this mystery to it that I sort of imagined in this mass-produced mm. world that, that the starting point was, you know, folding things and bending mm. things and, and, you know, I mean, I do it myself when you do, you, you, you think, what, what height should this be? So you get the nearest thing to hand, you get a bucket and you sit on it, you go, I think it should be a little bit higher, so you put a book under the mm. bucket, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. And, and I mean, I did that, I, it's funny you saying you designed um, a, costumes for ballet. I've just designed a set for Scottish ballet. And we have to make one of the parts of this pillar 
and we're in the workshop saying, well, what's the diameter of the pillar? I said, I don't know. So so we, so there was a bin, a huge big, you know, another bin, you know, this kind of bin. So we get it over and I'm looking at it and sort of trying to, you're doing that thing, blocking out the view of it with your finger and sort of imagining it taller. And so you start getting a big tube of paper and trying to, you know, sort yeah. of really ad hoc way, trying to yeah. work out. And then you go, yeah. well, I think it should be about that size, you know. Yeah. And I've got a more, before we have hopefully some questions from um, maybe a more sort of general but sort of strategic question um, on a more strategic level. I mean, how do you both feel, I mean, uh, Constantine's someone that's um, um, very highly uh, thought of in the art world and is present in the art world, especially with the uh, Design Reel show in 2009 at the Serpentine. Um, and Martin, as, as an artist who works with the vocabulary of design, or sort of past uh, the archive um, of design vocabulary. I mean, how do you feel? Um, I guess one thing that strikes me from going visiting many different studios is that artists like uh, Jorge and Alafor, and not in Martin's case because he works very much uh, on his own, which was a surprise, very sort of intimate, um, is that artists usually have a group of designers within the studio who are actually doing the literal designing of the things. Of the, designing the objects, the spaces, working with the uh, fabricators, or if they're in-house or not. Um, where designers also have designers working within the studios. I, I remember Jorge saying that um, like he would never have an artist work for him in the studio because of the ego kind of frictions there would be and there's an interview with one of his studio team that was kind of fired because of the friction and then came back um, which is quite amusing that's that's that, that that's in the book but it strikes me that it's in a way it's part of it's like the rise and the dominance of design throughout um, or design processes design context with the design Miami, you know, next door. It's, it's about, it's the riot, yeah, the dominance of design. I just wondered what you feel about the play between those two contexts. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's a, it's a question that's constantly asked and, you know, I, I was involved in a symposium in Zurich a couple of years ago and, I mean, nobody came up with a good answer. You know, it's, there's this relationship between design and art, and, and I think that the, on one hand, to try and look for that, to try and sort of find a definition point, you know, sort of reduces the possibilities of both. And I think the whole thing about, you know, I can't speak for the process of designing, but you know, the, the freedom. And I think the relationship is in the imaginative space, you know, is, is that is that there's some, I'm really interested in the presence of things, oh. a presence that something will have in a room that you can alter the atmosphere or the temperature, you know, of a space by, you know, placing something or arrangement of things in the room, you know. Yeah. I mean, I love yeah. the way, you know, just the, the, the different possibilities of how the legs on a table yeah. can touch the floor and, and, and yeah. their relationship with the tabletop. Yeah. It's, it, no, it just doesn't cease to kind of fascinate me and interest mm. me, and and I sort of translate some of that those feelings that I get mm. into my practice. And for me, it's very, mm. it's quite emotional, and it's about mm. feelings and sensations and mm. uh, that rather than. I mean, it's although there's absolute, you know, there's reference points that I maybe kind of veer towards. They're kind of they're useful for me, mm. uh, and sometimes conceptually useful in terms of the, some of the potential mm. meaning of the work or reading of the work. But um, but but by and large, it's about something else. You know, mm. it's about something you know, sort of it's more more difficult to put your finger on. Mm. You know, it's about mm. presence. You know. Mm. <laughs> I'd, yeah, I'd, I wouldn't have an answer to. <laughs> To the, uh, to, but uh, and I, I think of course it's uh, it's also very subjective in the end what you what relationship I feel uh, towards the or I have with with the art world I 
I like it has always interested me, even though I always knew that I was not, I'm not an artist. I, I don't, I couldn't be an artist. Um, um, but uh, looking at art, I, uh, I enjoy it, first of all. Uh, I think there's very good art. <laughs> Uh, even I think there are lots of artists that are pretty good designers, whereas I think that uh, there are hardly any designers that are good artists. Um, uh, I think art is an inspiration, or it, inspiration is such a shallow word, but it's it's a it is a reference for seeing things. Um, and now I'm, I'm speaking really about the, the kind of just the visual, the the, the kind of the that rich visual resource and the materials and I think artists push that much further than than we do as designers because we are um, certainly in industrial design we are we have those constraints um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we can't we I, I think we can we can change uh, these boundaries and and I I don't know I I, I find a lot of um, the kind of encouragement or, or reference in 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 art. Mm. I think artists, um, a lot of them, or anyway, the the few, <laughs> have an incredible sense for using space. That as designers, maybe we sometimes we don't have the the kind of how to occupy space. Mm. I, I think there's something mm. I, I really learned mm. from from. Fine artists, how to how to deal with space, and it's 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 not architectural. It's it's of something mm. else, maybe of what you you spoke about. This kind of the the, the presence of something, the the, the um, mm. and 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 this the, the physicality of it. Mm. Um, mm. And maybe um, just before, some, hopefully, some questions from you. W one thing that was nice for me visiting Constantin, who's very small office, five or six people, and Martin on his own some of the time, and then with maybe one assistant, perhaps more before before a show, was that there was space for me as a writer to sort of um, participate. There was a room for me to participate in the studio culture in some way, um, which was a very much a contrast with someone like Olafur's studio, where he had somebody like me, a writer, an academic, actually on the, uh, on the studio payroll, actually in, embedded in the studio, which was, a, which was um, intriguing, but also a, a kind of shock. But maybe that's, we can, we've got maybe five minutes for, for a few questions. There's no question. Uh, let me ask a question. Could you help me to understand again the, your concept of transdisciplinary vis-a-vis interdisciplinary and I don't know what uh, more uh, disciplinary there is? Uh, would be would be great. The disciplinary yeah, studio. sure. I mean, if you were speaking very, 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 very roughly, if, in if a way, I think it's uh, not really something new now. You know, we had artists, uh, designers, sure. like uh, centuries that were working uh, sure. both in fine arts and then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So for I, sure. I wonder if this is now. Yeah. I mean, it, what's your concept? It's not a suggestion that it's new, but I think that the interdisciplinary um, has been a term both in theory, say, generated by somebody like Bart in the late 60s, early 70s, um, the notion that two areas, two fields come together. Um, to make a, a third space in some way. I think that's been superseded now by a, a transdisciplinary um, situation whereby there are no, in reality, there are actually no hard and fast um, boundaries bet between disciplines. Um, and the way those disciplines play out in contexts like um, like a fair, for instance, um, and I guess the transdisciplinary as a concept is associated with 
Deleuze and Guattari in the uh, 70s and 80s. So I think that um, although you're right when you go back to the Bauhaus or the Soviet constructivists, there was a um, certain practitioners that were involved in architecture and art and design um, that usually they were actually different practitioners within a structure, say like the Bauhaus. It wasn't one, uh, one unit within that working between those, uh, between those three fields. Whereas I think now uh, when you think of Alafour or Constantin or Zaha Hadid or um, Ai Weiwei or many, many other people, I think that they are, uh, they are working in this, uh, in a transdisciplinary space, which isn't to say that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's more of a, it's a descriptive, uh, descriptive term. How do you handle with the concept of authorship when uh, so many people are involved in your work? Uh, I mean, f well, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, just, it's very straightforward. There's, it's, you know, it's, um, it's mine. <laughs> it's all <laughs> mine. No, it's, um, <laughs> well, yeah, and, but when actually when I do, when I talk about the work in a public way, I do occasionally or quite often find myself referring to we, you know, because I'm very aware, and it's not to say that it's a collaborative process as such, because, but, but when you do require other people to help the work kind of exist in the world, then th those, those people are incredibly important and their, you know, observations and, t you know, and, and, and um, expertise is really is hugely valuable, but the, of course the work w just wouldn't exist uh, without me. I mean, th th it's something I don't think a great deal about. You know, I, it's, it's what I do. I make I make I make work, and so uh, it's mine. <laughs> has my, has my name underneath it when it's the picture? <laughs> That's really not a very good answer. Sorry, if, if I can just jump in. When I was interviewing. Um, some of the different studio assistants. Um, uh, one of st Jorge's studio assistants in moves between LA and Mexico. I, I asked that same question. How do you feel or how do you know when you're designing something that you are authoring for Jorge correctly in a way that he would, he would want that done? And I was asking a question along those lines. And she said, do you mean how do I dilute my sense of self? And I thought that was really um, not sad, but very uh, kind of indicative. Um, by, by contrast, at uh, Constantine's studio, um, I was speaking at length with, uh, uh, with Olivia, one, one, one of your, one of your uh, designers. And she made a really good point. She said, you know, once you get to the stage where you're designing for a designer, where you, it becomes too limited, there's too many limitations, and you find yourself wanting to really diverge with the direction they're taking a design in, then you, you need to set up your own, you, you need to set up your own studio. And I thought that was, that they were two, but, but yeah. I mean, just to, to, to answer for my, my particular case, or that's representative, I think, for design, uh, of course, uh, um, I would say in the same way as Martin says, it's, uh, the, I, I'm the author, uh, the, the product has my name written on it, but my name actually stands for an office. And on my website, for example, I always, list the name of the assistant who I work with for every product. Um, doesn't mean that we are equal co-authors, but I think the assistants, and maybe we haven't spoken enough about this mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. uh, the assistance is very important. There's the assistants, my assistant within the studio, and then of course there's the company, and, and uh, in, in my case, of course, there's an authorship also, the producer, so there, there would be the, a company called Vitra with 
Charles Eames <laughs> or Charles Eames with Vitra, whatever, and, and it's like that. So the, there's an authorship, um, the idea, I think, um, uh, I, I have the authorship of the idea and then the whole process and in a way, the, in the end, the manufacturer uh, has another authorship and that's clearly um, defined in, in, in the design world. And I, I guess with art, I mean, in a way, it, it, it doesn't surprise me that you, that you, that you say because it... Well, at the end of the... Because I mean, it art relies for its, uh, I don't know, for its weight and I guess for its market value. Art, art relies on the fact that it's... That, that's... There is an authorship. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it, I, th I think my model of... Um, but it's from my perspective, it's relatively tr traditional. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, I'm not... Yeah. The model that I, I, I have as, as a kind of as a maker or, or a producer of art isn't. I'm not attempting to challenge mm. Mm -hmm. anything within yeah. that. You know, but mm. hopefully the work itself. You know, there'll be times when it when it creates attention. You know, mm. with with what's around it. But but certainly, the, the, yeah, it, it's, it's it's pretty straightforward. Mm. You know, is there maybe is there time for one last question? No, we're going to end there. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank Martin. You. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you.